If you're not there yet, uh, turn in your scriptures to Matthew 12. We're continuing on, and uh, actually next week we would have been, we'll be, have been in the, this book of Matthew for one year. So, um, boy, time go, does go by. And, I mean, chapter 20, it goes to chapter 28, and we're chapter 12, so... Um, I imagine it won't take us quite as long to get through the rest of it, a couple more bigger chunks. Um, but today we're going to go ahead and, and look at a couple things. We're going we're gonna to look at kind of uh, a number of things with, with a, about, uh, well, if you look at it just on the outskirts, it's about a fish, a woman that came from far away, a house with a whole bunch of demons, and Jesus maybe being rude to his family. And so just on the outskirts, you can look at things and go, what's going on? But because we've been going through this, there's a whole bunch that we'll go ahead and we'll look at it and we'll pull it in. And we'll see that, you know, Jesus' response is pretty accurate to where it should be as the Pharisees are just continually trying to seek him. I mean, here we have the Pharisees and the Pharisees, as we'd looked at, they're trying to kill Jesus. So Jesus knows that. So imagine you're out in the community <coughs> and you hear people kind of are devising a plot to kill you. And then you show up in church today and those people are here. That would kind of get, be, make you a little concerned, wouldn't it? So <coughs> this is what we're going to look at is the Pharisees just aren't continually trying to trap Jesus. And they're wanting a sign. I remember when I was in college, I often I came to know the Lord, and I often wanted to tell those people who seemed furthest away <coughs> from Jesus about the gospel. Like, it just was like, they are so far from Jesus, that they just need to know Jesus. And so... I had a, a professor that was in my science class, and he was going ahead, and he was teaching about evolution and all this and that. And I just, I sat there in my chair, and I wasn't one to you know, sorry, raise my hand up and speak in front of class unless the teacher opened up, uh, and, and this teacher didn't. So I went to his office. I'm like, all right, it's clear that he needs Jesus. And so I went to his office, and I, and, and I was in Campus Crusade for Christ, and so I opened up the four spiritual laws, of course, I'm shaken, you know. I haven't been a Christian for just a couple of years. Maybe, maybe like almost a year and a half or something. And here I am, ready to share the gospel with my professor, knowing that my professor really wants to flunk me. He could. And so here I am shaking. And I'm going through the four spiritual laws, kind of looking, and he starts laughing. <coughs> And so that's a little disconcerting when, you know, here you're presenting the gospel to somebody and they just start laughing. And so I had to stop. I had to ask, why, you know, what's going on here? And what he said was his wife continually tells him about the gospel. And I'm using the same words and the same things that his wife's talking about. He said, to be honest, I, I really have a hard time with the evidence. If, if Jesus would do a miracle, then I would trust in him. And so, in my mind, I'm like, Jesus has done miracles. But what he wanted to see was like something right in front of his face. And so all the meantime, he misses all the miracles that are recorded in Scripture. And, and it is trying to say, all right, if you work, if you do things how I want you to do things, then I'll trust in you. And, and I just sat there, I'm like, I can't command God to do anything like that. And, and so we parted ways, and he didn't flunk me, and I was excited about that. And, and I just continued to pray for him. In a lot of ways, even those people who have trusted in Jesus still act a little bit the same way, right? God, if you really want to have me do this, then make it evident in my life. You know, if you really want me to step out in faith and whatever, maybe contribute to the missions fund, or, or you really want me to witness to my family again and again after they've rejected me, or if you, Lord, if you really want me to go on a, on a missions trip, then, then just give me a sign. 
If you really want me to stop doing this sin that I know is wrong, just make it evident. God goes, here's the evidence. Look in Scripture. Even the smallest things give testimony to me. And how many greater things have you seen in witness that why wouldn't you change your life? Well, that's kind of what we're looking at today. And so I have a couple questions for you. As we start off, uh, the first question I have for you is, um, what are the things that people reject even though they are true? Now, you know there are some true things out there. And even if somebody heard them, they would just flat out reject you. Now, I started coming up with a list. I'm like, I may say something. I'd be like, this is true. And there may be somebody here that's like, that's not true. And just you'd be all mad at me and everything like that. So I went for the, I went for the easy Christian ones. And then I'll talk about the areas that are a little bit more difficult. Um, so male and female. XX chromosome, XY chromosome. XX, female, XY, male. Pretty easy. But there's people that disagree with that. Uh, life begins at conception. And look, heart, you know, quickly heartbeat, all that, a new life. But you know that there are people that will just reject that. Even though you, you can go, no, really, look at the truth right here. Um, premarital sex is a sin. People like to work their way around that. And then there's other things in life where maybe you're one way or another. And so I'm just giving you the general category, the environment. You go, I know that there are certain things that are going on in the environment. That's true. And you'll find out somebody doesn't hold to that. Or uh, maybe medical conclusions. And so, you know, this is true in medicine. And people are like, no, not really. And, and it doesn't matter the evidence um, and... There are so many things like that, that there are facts to back up the evidence, but people aren't going to accept it. And so that's what kind of the Pharisees are facing here. We're going to look at it a little bit more in depth, but really Jesus' claim is, hey, the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. You've rejected it. I'm the Messiah. And, and here, look at the evidence and you're still going to reject it. It's not that you reject the truth. You're not willing to accept the truth because you'd rather hold on to your truth. You'd rather hold on to your power. And so that makes the Pharisees really upset. And, and we'll get into all of that. Uh, so that's what we're looking at as well as because Jesus was not behaving the way they wanted, the Pharisees tried to control the situation. I mean, really. I mean, when we, when we, when we try to control the situation, we're, we try to say, all right, I, I want Jesus to operate the way I want him to operate. Has Jesus sometimes operated in the way that you thought wasn't what you wanted? I think all of us can go, oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, think about it. Maybe, maybe um, some family relationships have changed and you don't want them to be that way. Or maybe that, that you, you're, you thought your job would go differently and you're like, all right, Jesus, if you're really there, you'll change this situation at work. Or maybe you have somebody that is going through cancer. And you, and you just pray and you pray. And is it wrong to pray for the healing? Not at all. It's a good thing. But then it doesn't happen, and maybe they die, and you go, God, I, I thought you said you'd answer prayers. I thought you'd heal them. I, you can heal. I've seen in Scripture. We've been looking at it. And it doesn't fit exactly how we like it or want it to fit. And so we get mad at Jesus, and we go, no, I'm going to make control of my life. I'm going to make the things happen the way I want them to happen, because you're not doing it the way I want you to. And then we end up pushing Jesus away. When really the truth of the matter is, we have a wrong understanding of who Jesus says he is and what he does to. I mean, he calls upon us to turn to trust in him. The evidence is here. I mean, last week, the whole balloon illustration, it was to show 
beyond a shadow of doubt, we, Jesus claims to be Messiah, and he is. And yet people reject that. And again, we, a couple weeks past that, we had this whole illustration with a backpack. And it was this whole thing of, all right, he says that he will take care of our burdens. He will take care of us. He will carry us through these difficult things. And you come through a hard patch. And you go, Jesus, where are you? He says, no, I'm, I'm still there. It just didn't pan out how you thought it would. But life is better in following after Jesus than doing it on your own. So those are kind of what we're looking at this morning. So if you're not there, open your Bibles to Matthew 12. We'll start in chapter or in verse 38, and we'll actually go all the way through the end. And so here it is. Some of the uh, scribes and Pharisees, so he added in the scribes, so it's teachers of the law, he added in with the Pharisees, because earlier he'd been talking about the Pharisees, uh, answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. All right. It sounds like a legitimate thing. I mean, they've seen miracles, and, and we could kind of look. Again, miracles and signs are essentially the same thing, but I think when Matthew uses the word sign, he's, he's saying, they're saying, all right, give us a particular thing right here and now that confirms prophecy. So let's see that prophecy from the Old Testament is being fulfilled. And so that's what they're asking the, the, the Jesus. And then he gives an answer. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So what does he say? He's like, all right, you adulterous generations, Pretty harsh. Like, if you, if you opened Scripture and you just started reading this, this story right here, you'd be like, all right, Jesus, that's a little harsh right now. They're wanting to see who you are, and you just called them an adulterous people? But what we, what we have to remember is, like, they've come after him. Like, they planted people. Like, hey, look, let's, let's do this, and let's catch his disciples doing wrong on the Sabbath. Let's put this man in the temple and let's have him heal him on the Sabbath. Let's go ahead and, and set up this scenario so we can catch Jesus and have people turn against him. And so, understand, do they really want a sign? No, they don't. They want to go ahead and they want to cap, trap Jesus and they want the crowds to turn away from him. Because their idea of who Jesus should be, the Messiah should be, is a, a, is a warrior uh, that's going to deliver him from Rome and going to provide this military victory. And here Jesus comes in and saying, you know what, a bruised reed, I'm not going to hurt that. I'm not going to make that go away. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be gentle. I'm kind. Understand the mercy and the grace that I bring. And that's not who they wanted. And so he's real firm with them. I mean, think about it. Just last week, we talked about how they blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. They were attributing the things that the Holy Spirit was doing through Jesus to Satan. And so it's not as though they're, they're really friendly. So Jesus just calls them out and says, Hey, you have chosen to follow after other gods than me. You have committed spiritual adultery. You, you should follow me. You know who I am. Follow after me and my father. And they go, no, we want to follow after our own hearts. And so he says, all right, I'm not going to give you a sign. No sign will be given. And he says, all right, here's a sign. And he says, this is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, when we think of Jonah, what comes to your mind? All right. We think about a Jewish individual who just really didn't like foreigners. In fact, he wanted the Ninevites just to perish. He went to great length for them to perish. So you just think about that. Here is uh, the, the God of, of, of the Jews first, uh, but as, he, as he's their God, they want, they're, they're supposed to go out to other nations or proclaim well, the Ninevites were not very nice to the Jewish people at all. And so Jonah's like, no, God, you have me go. You want me to go to there? I'm going to go the opposite direction. 
And so we have this whole story, but yet then Jesus go ahead and he narrows it down to just a particular scene in the story of Jonah that is unique. And so let's go ahead and, and see that. And so he goes ahead and he points to uh, what the particular thing that Jonah did. And it says this. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will raise up at the judgment, judgment of this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something as greater than Jonah is here. So what does he focus on? He focuses on the big fish that swallows up Jesus. Now, if you, if you watch a lot of kids' shows and stuff like that, that's their main focus. But if you really look at the story of Jonah, that's just really a small part of it. But what happens? Uh, the big wave comes, and Jonah says, it's me, and then they don't really want to throw him over, and Jonah's like, yeah, you got to throw me over. And so they, th- why don't they want to throw him over? Because it's certain he'll die. It's a huge storm. Nobody could survive in that. So Jonah was as certain as dead. They throw him overboard. And what happens? He gets swallowed up by a big old fish. And then he gets spit out on land. He still doesn't really want to be there preaching to the Ninevites. And so he goes and he tells a message and they all turn. So because the Ninevites saw Jonah, who was certain as to die, was, was rescued from death and stayed in the belly of the whale, it, this is a sign of something that's going to happen further. Just as Jonah was in the whale, so Jesus, and, and he's kind of alluding to his death right here, that's going to happen to him. This, that's going to happen to Jesus. Again, Bigger sign, man swallowed up by a fish, or, and then certain is dead, being spit out, and, and then preaching the gospel. And then they might go and listen to a guy that they really don't like and would rather not listen to, a Jew. They go ahead and they turn. In fact, Jonah, Jonah's just completely upset at that. But think about that. Those people come and they trust and they follow in Jesus. They, they, follow, they know Yahweh. And here, a sign of Jesus being thrown in the grave and going to certain is dead and come back to life. What more is a testimony of that? If you're going to reject that, of course those Ninevites are just going to say, no, we just saw a thing with a fish. How much greater is, is that of Jesus rising from the dead? You're going to, they're going to go, the Ninevites are going to just stand in condemnation of this generation because you have rejected the Messiah. And then if that wasn't enough, he goes ahead and he's going to bring one more. But before we go there, I just want to quickly look at uh, just 1 Kings 10.1. Uh, you don't have to flip there, but in 1 Kings and then also in 2 Chronicles 9, there's a story of uh, the Queen of Sheba. And 1 Kings uh, says this. It says, and now the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to test him with hard questions. And if you continue on on that, you see that she did see that, that the one who Solomon followed, who gave him the wisdom, was God. And so they, he, she ends up just giving gift after gift after gift. But here this Gentile individual that just hears a rumor of how God is working and just goes ahead, and, and some say uh, Ethiopia, others say more in the category uh, of Yemen. Um, here she goes ahead and travels long and far with all these possessions, saying, all right, the God who you follow, Solomon, that is truly God. And so, so just kind of a, another a condemnation. Let's go ahead and look at that. So in, in verse uh, 42, it says this, the queen of the south will rise up at judgment, uh, at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. 
For he came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So this individual came and did great and, and followed after God and just changed, radically changed her life. She didn't have much to go on. But here, this, that generation that was hearing him, there Jesus was right in front of them. Jesus was casting out demons. Jesus was healing the blind, giving the words to the mute. He was there performing miracles. And, you're, and, and, and he's saying to the Pharisees and the scribes, and you're not going to trust him? On the day of judgment, these individuals had, had a whole lot less evidence trusted in Jesus. So you will rightly stand condemned, is, is essentially what Jesus is saying. Is he harsh? Yeah. But is he rightly harsh? Absolutely. But think of us today. Think here we are, and think of the evidence that we have heard of Jesus around us, that he is for us, that he is for his glory and his kingdom. First and primary, he is, he is about him. But what did he do? He has shown grace and mercy and love and forgiveness. However, there will be a time that there will be a judgment. And you've had all this information. Oh, what are you? You have no excuse. The judgment that you receive it will be right and just. And so, I remember. Um, I, I, known the Lord, kind of going to a church. And as I was in that church, believe it or not, I was sitting in a, I hadn't been there long, but I was sitting listening to a pastor and he was saying some things. I'm like, does that pastor know Jesus or not? Again, I, I'm, not, I'm not even going to make a, I don't know if he did or not. I just don't know that. But one of the things struck me that came out of his mouth. He said, how, he said, a loving God could not send anybody to hell. And, I, and, I, and I'm like, that's not true. You've equated, two, you've equated something that you've heard, and it's not really the truth. God, God's love, because God loves, He is just, He is holy, He is righteous, and He upholds that because a just judge has to be righteous and has to provide consequences, and has to deal with things rightly. And so I went ahead, and, and in fact, it was right before I was going to seminary, and, and so I, I went out to him for a meal and, and, and had this conversation with him, and then the next week turned around and asked him for a recommendation to go to seminary. And I, and I said to him, I said, that, how can somebody their whole life who rejects God how, how is that loving for God to then just go ahead and force them to be in, in heaven and eternity with him forever? And I didn't get into all the other arguments, but he goes, huh, I never thought of it that way. Just think about it. People who re rebel and reject God, I mean, and they're, and, they're, and they're just clearly doing that. God's, kind of, God, God's not just going to say, all right, you know, I know you're angry at me. I know you reject me. Here, you receive all the benefits. No. You said, God said, and in, in through the word and through all, all the scripture says, what has to happen is you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust upon the work that he's done on the cross. There's no other way. And it's available to all who trust and rely upon him. And so it, it is gracious and it is loving because God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to live the life that we couldn't live, to, to die, to be buried, put in the grave, and then to rise again, conquering sin and death. And he says, all right, I, I've paid the punishment for all who trust in me. And so you've got God's love and His righteousness and His holiness all there together. And the Pharisees are there just going, no, we don't want this. We want to have it our own way. So then, and he goes ahead and, and, and kind of changes things up. And, and it's, it's a parable. And so again, um, this isn't a, a, a 
place necessary to get your whole theology of, of evil spirits and stuff like this. But he is making a particular point on this. He says in verse uh, 30, uh, 43, Then unclean spirit has gone out of a person. It passes through a waterless place seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house which I came. And it, when it came, it found the house empty, swept, and put in order. All right. So, kind of a strange thing going on right there. Right? And so, so I'm just going to stop right here and just kind of look at it. So we have an unclean spirit. It goes out of a person. So, and apparently, you know, the, the idea back then is that spirits um, was try, would try to, tried to seek rest and, and, and find uh, a place to do it uh, and try to find you know, so places of water, uh, but it couldn't find any. And then after that, it, it goes out and, it, and it, it returns back and it, it founds a house. So what is he, who's this house? What is he referring to? And it's actually, we'll find out near the end. And so he, he comes and he finds the house empty and swept and put in order. So, so what happens then? He says, well, uh, then it goes out and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and it enters and dwells there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So still, you know, trying to understand a little foggy here. But then he puts on that last little sentence. So also will be this evil generation. So we're talking, he's talking to those that are there right then and there, the Pharisees and the scribes. And he's saying, there's going to be something that's going to happen that's worse. And so ultimately what he's saying is, here, the gospel is before you. And then they kind of were, were entertained and then kind of trying to figure, all right, who is this Jesus? And then what do they do? They reject Jesus. And God's saying, all right, you've rejected the Son of Man. What the consequences that you are going to receive is much worse because you have seen and heard the evidence of who Jesus is. And so the consequences are going to be greater. And then that's the point that he's trying to make. And again, this isn't a new point, is it? Earlier in the book of Matthew, we looked at it. He says, you know what? Those towns that Jesus performed miracles and signs and, and that were his own hometown, he said, you know what? Their judgment is going to be worse than, than these Gentile cities. In fact, the, the Jews are going to go ahead and, and it's going to be worse for them than in Sodom. So there's going to be a greater consequence because you, the, these Pharisees have received the evidence and they're going to reject it. And so the consequences are going to be great. And so you kind of see how those two things come in line. Here, here's Gentile individuals that are going to go ahead, uh, the Ninevites and, and then... Uh, the Queen of Sheba, they're going to go ahead and stand judgment of the Jews that rejected him in that generation. And he says, all right, understand how severe this is. You are in a bad place. I came, I tried to present the good news. You rejected me. It's going to be worse for you. And then he goes ahead and brings in another illustration, which is... It's interesting in and of itself. It says, And while he was there speaking to the people, his mother and his brother stood outside asking uh, to speak to him. Verse 47. How many of you have a verse 47 in your Bible? Look in there. Where'd it go? What happened? I bet there are probably some people, if you, if you open up, it goes from 46 to 48, but... There is a verse, and some people probably, maybe they'll have it in brackets or something in uh, verse 47. And what happens is it's on a lot of manuscripts, but there's two key manuscripts that it's not in. And so some translations have chosen to go ahead and not include it. 
However, it probably makes better flow that it is in there. And so, uh, again, what we have in the Hebrew and especially in the Greek is kind of what we're looking at. There is plenty of evidence to show this is the Word of God. In fact, the original manuscripts are called the autographa. That's a big word, but it's just the original manuscripts. And we don't have any of those today, which, which is fine because I, I think in, in God's best plan, I think he would know what we would do if we actually had the original copies. We'd go ahead and we'd end up worshiping it and, and elevating it to a place it shouldn't be elevated to. But what we have is tons and tons of, of documents throughout the years that are, are copies of the original. And so what they do is they go ahead and they, they look at the manuscripts and they say, all right, what do we have the most of? And then besides just having the most of it, which ones are maybe older? Because older documents are probably more reliable, but then you can't forget also the region. So those closer around to where Jesus was, you probably give those, and be like, oh, those are probably more reliable than those that maybe were far out. And so that's some of the, the choices that the translators have to make. And so, um, again, it doesn't change the point of the story. But if it were to be there, and, and I think it is, it would say, and, and some of them said, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. They're, they're standing outside waiting. And so that gives us more of a context what's going on. Because if you jump from just 46 to 48, it, it's a little abrupt and you, you kind of have some more questions. Um, and some people say, well, there's a little bit of a repetition in verse 47 and 48. And so they thought, oh, that was a scribal error. And that's maybe how it originally came out. Like, let's not duplicate. Let's just take it out. But again, it doesn't change the reliability of Scripture in one bit or shape or form. It just actually shows that what we have in Scripture is really accurate to what the originals were. But in this case, um, they didn't include it. And so, again, so verse 47, something like this. And some told them, look, your mother and brother are standing outside waiting to speak to you. But he replied to the men who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hands towards the disciples, he said, Here are my uh, mother and my brothers. So what he says is, All right, here's the evidence. Here is the fact that, that I, I am here. And, and those that are following after me is, is deeper for those who have trusted and are following after than me than my own blood-related brother and sister. Our mother, our mother and brothers. And so a couple things going on here is that Jesus is saying, all right, who belongs to the kingdom of God? Who belongs to the kingdom of heaven? Those who trust in me. In fact, it gives a little interesting insight of Jesus' mother and, and the brothers that maybe at this point, they're not fully engaged. In fact, they're, they're, they're standing outside and it, says, and it says, you know what, in, in verse 50, it says, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, this is my brother and sister and mother. So those that truly trust in me, that's who the kingdom of God belongs to. That's, that's the most important relationship in your life. And that's what we should be as a church where our relationships with inside the church, with those other believers, should be stronger than those relationships with our relatives. And, and, and the point that is being made really clear is, look, those who have come and who have trusted me and rely upon me, those are the true children of God. I mean, you just look through Galatians and Romans. I mean, it's consistently throughout. Who are the descendants of Abraham? Who are God's children? Well, uh, yeah, there is those that were physical descendants. But the true children of Abraham, as it talks about in Galatians and Romans and other places throughout Scripture, is those that have trusted in me. And so I think a lot of times what we have is we have churches that are just kind of filled 
filled with people, and there are people that just happen to, they, they don't happen, they're sitting in there, they sit in there, and they go, all right, because I go to church week in and week out, I'm a Christian. Does going to church make you a Christian? Not at all. What does Jesus say? He says, those who trust in me, those who believe in me, those are the true believers. Those are really my children. You can do a whole bunch of religious activities, and a lot of people do a whole bunch of religious activities. But what they do is they go, all right, I'll do these religious activities, but I'm not willing to trust in the Jesus that's in Scripture. Some of these sayings are too hard. And so I don't want to humble myself. I don't want to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because there are some hard things in there. So, so I'll do some of my life, some of, some of Jesus, and I'll be fine. What does Jesus say? He says, no. I mean, just, you know, John was talking about the songs this morning. There were other songs that were just there that go, in fact, it, when you're singing the words to the song, do you ever think through them? Like, I give my all to you. I follow after you all, you know, and, and I seek you above everything. I mean, you see, sometimes people, we, we, we sing that, and yet it, words come out of our mouths, but our hearts are far from that. And so we're being like this hypocrite right here in church. We're going, I sing this to you, Lord but I'm not going to do it in my life. This is no. You have the evidence before you. Trust in me. Follow after me. No, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You understand their, their, their condemnation is going to be great. How much greater I think the condemnation of those who week in and week out say, I know who you are, Jesus, but I want me instead of you. My heart goes out. I pray. Again, all of us before trusting in Christ were in that position. Every one of us. We're all... I mean, think about, you know, what we like to do in the stories of Scripture is we like to make ourselves the hero, right? We, looked at, we like to put ourselves as, as David. We like to put ourselves as Solomon having all this wisdom. We like to put ourselves in Jesus' feet. This is who we are. But too often than not, we're like the bad guy. And we consistently are. It's only by God's grace that we can have life in Him. So I just, I just want to encourage you just in, in following after God. And let me, let me go ahead and read this for you. We like to view ourselves as the one who never acts like the Pharisees. The truth is, we have some of the same tendencies We want more evidence or proof that following Jesus is the best for us. And so oftentimes, we're trying to ask, come on, Jesus, give me another sign. Give me another sign that I'm supposed to do what is right and to do what honors you. All the meanwhile, Jesus says, look, and my life, my death, my resurrection, that's enough. What more do you need and I think about Lazarus, you know. Hey, send somebody. You know, no. What we have is enough. Again, I encourage you to evaluate your own life. To say, what areas am I saying I'm not willing to hand over? What areas am I not fully engaged to follow after Jesus? What are those areas? And is it really worth it? Do you not have enough evidence that Jesus is who he claimed to be? If you don't, if you feel like you don't, just read scripture. I mean, it's there. Why hold on to your sin that you, that you so cherish and love? It's not, not going to do you any good. Hey, I'm right there. 
I have to continually remind myself of the truths that are in Scripture to make sure I act out in the right way. You know, we're supposed to, call, we're called, and I mean, look at the sermon, to love our enemies, to bless those who persecute you. But what's our tendency? Well, oh, somebody says something bad about you, or, or, or you don't like something, you're critical, you're judgmental, and all of this, and you got to check yourself and go, no, it's not worth it. This is not what God has called me to do. Do I need any more evidence? No, it's all here in Scripture. So, that, I mean, is pursuing after sin, is doing sin at any time ever good? No. But how often do we, are we faced with that question and we go, maybe just a little bit's okay. Or all sin knowing about God's forgiveness. But God says, don't act that way. Know that I am the best. And so... I just want to leave you with this. Uh, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is a sign to all that Jesus is the Messiah. It's the greatest sign that there is. As though he were, just as Jonah, as though he were dead, certain for death, God redeemed, God saved. And just think about the mercy in that. Jesus went to the cross. He could call down a legion of angels. But he, why didn't he? He was obedient to the Father. So was obedience to God weak? Not at all. Think about how Jesus was obedient. Our call is to proclaim the cross of Jesus while fully following after him. We're not supposed to be like in this scene where Jesus' mother and brothers are just kind of on the outside. Hey, tell them we're here. He wants us to be in the house knowing who He is, seeking to follow Him. Fully devoted followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not like, all right, I'll evangelize if it's convenient. I'll make disciples if I want to. I'll pray if somebody is praying and tells me to pray, but he wants people going, man, I can't do anything else but talk about Jesus. I can't do anything else except study God's word and tell other people about it. I can't do anything else but proclaim the gospel and to know him and to know his uh, grace, his mercy, and his love and his forgiveness because of what he's done for me. Let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. Just, just ask Him, not only just for yourselves to, to be more committed in following after Jesus, but also pray for those that don't know Him. So there, are, there are people geographically that are around us that don't know Jesus. God has put in place the church this local expression so that we would witness to those that are around us. That's our call as faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just ask God to help us in our hearts that we would do that faithfully. Lord, we do come before you. We thank you for your love and your mercy and grace. Lord, I pray for those that are, are currently looks like they are going to receive the judgment that is rightly due. I pray that, that you would work in their hearts, that they would humbly come before you and seek you and know you. Lord, I pray that you would use us as individuals, as a church, to proclaim the gospel. I pray for for me and for all of us, Lord, that as we're here today, that we continually are seeking, seeking you going, Lord, do you really want me to follow you? Asking that question and the, and the answer is 
a resounding yes. So I pray when we ask that question that we wouldn't hesitate, but that we'd boldly follow after you. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truths that are in it. I pray that we would not forget these words, but that we would commit it to memory and that we would live it out. Lord, I thank you for your mercy and grace. It's in your name we do pray. Amen.